Hello everyone, thank you all for being here today. I'm Robert Patterson, I'm one of my uh, father's sons. And um, we're so grateful you could all join us today in celebrating the life, extraordinary life of my father, Tony Patterson. And so here's the thing, in lieu of a religious service, my father wasn't that religious and I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, we decided to celebrate his life with a concert and with some music because he really loved classical music and he loved music in general. Um, and since, uh, and for all of you, you can make it after this, um, there's a little bit of a picnic at our place uh, where we're gonna show some of his work because uh, he was a sculptor. And uh, we'll be unveiling a brand new bronze cast that actually we just finished a few days ago. So those of you that can make it, we'd love for you to see that. Uh, and we'll also be showing a few of his other works as well. So I'm just gonna say a few remarks about what this is today and then I'll speak a little bit later about my father. Um, but I just wanna give a little context. Um, my father really loved the music of certain composers. He loved the music of Aaron Copland, who actually had ties to, to uh, Saratoga Springs. Uh, he also loved the Sibelius Violin Concerto. Um, he grew up, uh, when he was growing up, he would hear one of his neighborhood friends playing that piece. And so it stuck with him for the rest of his life. And every time he heard it, he would tear up. It was really a powerful piece for him. So we were grateful today to have our wonderful musicians playing that piece and the other pieces that you'll hear today. And it was actually the last piece I played before he died. And so that's, it was special for that reason. And he loved that piece. Um, there's a piece of mine you'll hear today that we decided to program uh, because it was written for a colleague uh, who's a bassoonist and whose father was a cellist. And it was in memory of his father. And I was also thinking of my own father when I wrote the piece and my son, Dylan. Um, and there's a version of it for bassoons. There's also a version for two cellos. So the one you'll hear today is with two cellos. So I was thinking about my father when I wrote the piece, and his father, and the continuum of life, death, and birth, and even the birth of my own son, Dylan, who's here today. Um, and this piece quotes a couple pieces by Bach, uh, which was another composer my dad loved. So we'll hear that today. And then you'll also hear uh, from my uncle, Carl, who my mother's brother, um, and he knew my father well, and we were grateful that he's representing the Cohen half of the family and speaking about my dad for a little bit and giving a tribute. Um, we also hear today a poem by a poet named Irving Feldman. So my dad taught at the University of Buffalo and Irving was one of his favorite colleagues and he loved Irving's poetry. And uh, since Irving couldn't make it today, he's 94 so it was a little tough for him to get around. But I asked Irving, I said, hey, would you be able to suggest a poem that we could all read? And so he gave us a poem that you'll hear Juliana, uh, my wife's sister, read. and. Um, and that poem's on the back of the program, so you can read along while she's reading it. Um, finally, before we get on to the, the slideshow and some more music and the rest of the program, I just wanna thank all the wonderful musicians for being here. 
Um, really grateful that they could be here and do this. Also to Skidmore College and to the Arthur Zankel Music Center and all the staff here. Everybody's been so wonderful in letting us use this hall. So anyway, this is a celebration. This isn't a memorial, so you don't have to feel sad. And I'm gonna say a few jokes, and we're gonna have some fun today, because my dad would have wanted that. He wouldn't want anybody to be sad on his behalf. He'd want everybody to have fun. So let's enjoy the rest of the program and have some fun. Thanks.
Hello, everyone. I'm honored to be reading this poem today. When Rob invited me to read a poem for his dad, Tony, at the memorial, he sent this poem by Irving Feldman, along with Irving's phone number, saying Irving would love to talk to me about the poem. So I called him. Irving is 94 years young and sends his condolences to Ellie and Tony's children. The poem is about looking at George Siegel's sculptures, and Irving wanted me to share this, and also remembering through family photographs, remembering ancestors and those who have passed, connecting to the living. But what struck me most about talking to Irving was his regard of the poem, as if he was speaking about a child of his, how much passion he had for every word written, a kind of fresh amazement. And I did not know Tony well, but I know Rob, and through the things I've heard, I think Tony was also this way, a prolific sculptor. Rob and Tori's basement is chocked full of sculptures. and his, his sculptures celebrated humanity by skillfully portraying the human form. And then when Tony could no longer make his art, and way before that, I always felt he fully supported and celebrated his son's talents. I had the opportunity to go to Mexico on a vacation with Rob, Tori, Ellie, and Tony, and Dylan. And I remember one moment when Tony's eyes filled with emotion, his speech fast, and his hands moving as he passionately spoke of Rob's music and his success as a composer artist. A rare and wonderful quality in a father, pure unconditional delight. So here is this poem, and as Irving said, it's an introduction to the we, the living and those now guiding us from the other side. They say to us, they say to us in quiet voices, matter of fact, hushed with feeling, to which we murmur our responses. Here, this is the one, of course you never met him, and this is his wife, this one is her brother. He passed on a year ago July, here she's holding her eldest. You can see she's pregnant, that would have been with little William to which we murmur, yes, yes, I see, I see him, I see her. Yes, takes after the father. No, I never met him, so that's the brother? Where is she now? We are passing photos from hand to hand, the living and the dead, who mingle here as nowhere else. Almost we heft the squares of shining paper, on our palms as if to ponder better the weight of being. And yes, truly, they appreciate under our gaze, augment in our considering. It's all very important. This ritual is profound, solemn, religious. We feel it, become weighty ourselves, judicious like gods, even and merciful in judgment, simple, courteous and worthy. Now we hand the photos back. There they are, little William, her brother, the neighbor's girl, all of them pressed close in a single pack in dark and radiant density. All of us here are deeply satisfied.
was uh, an amazing piece of music, and it struck me, <clears throat> and it strikes me, how music fills the space, doesn't it? And as I, as I look around the hall and see how you're all arranged, you're all filling the space, right? You're spread out. And it just struck me as a metaphor for Tony. He really did fill the space, didn't he? I mean, both his persona, he was a big person, and his art filled the space. And so I think we're all kind of recapitulating that here today. Uh, I'm Carl Cohen, I'm Ellie's baby brother, as she likes to <laughs> remind me. I first met Tony sometime in the 1960s when Ellie brought him home to our apartment in Dorchester, Massachusetts for dinner. I recall our mother Anne's initial less than enthusiastic reception, eagle-eyed observer of ethnic proven provenance that she was. She quickly assessed that there was nothing about Tony that said Jewish. Years later, when Tony and Anne had developed what I know was a deep affection for one another, Tony asked Anne to sit for a portrait, which we have in our living room. The resulting bust was a work of great craftsmanship. But I think Anne was not thrilled with it. I recall her saying something to the effect that it made her look like she was from the shtetl in the old country, as she sometimes called it. In fact, I think those words were code for too Jewish. Tony couldn't win. Sometime after meeting Tony, Ellie invited me to Tony's apartment on Symphony Road across the street from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts where he was studying. I recall my shock at entering this place. It was an assault on the senses and the psyche. Imagine a world in which Tony Patterson is in charge of housekeeping. When the definitive Tony Patterson biopic is released, I'm convinced that it will take Hollywood, a Hollywood set designer, a minimum of a year to recreate the amazing chaos of that place. Yet as astonishing as the place was, the sculptures in various states of completion that filled it were even more so. Tony's work delighted and challenged me. His representational and figurative pieces filled me with awe at his artistic mastery. And his more creative ones shocked, delighted, and yes, titillated me. During that visit, I could see Ellie periodically glancing at Tony with a look of love that I had never seen on her before. She had found Mr. Wright. Six decades later, I saw that same look on Ellie's face when my wife Suzanne and I last saw him here in Saratoga Springs shortly before he passed away. Tony was a man of great passion. He spoke animatedly and loudly about political and social topics. He was passionate about his family, especially his sons Robert and David. He lavished attention on them as people, as well as on their musical careers, with an intensity verging at times on fanaticism, but in a good way. Drum sets, flutes, marathon road trips to faraway places for lessons with the best, passionate about art. Tony and Ellie filled their home as well as mine and their children's with their beautiful creations. Passionate about photography. I think it is accurate to say that at one point in time, Tony owned one each of every lens ever manufactured by the Nikon camera company. Ellie, Robert, David, Dylan, Philip, Junga, and Victoria, I know you will cherish your memories of Tony as I do, and my wife Suzanne and our children Zoe and Phoebe do, 
and does everyone else here today. Irrepressible, unforgettable, Tony was himself a monument to a life lived large. Goodbye, Tony. And in a phrase you used so often that I can hear you saying it, it was wild. Thank you.
So uh, it's hard to follow music that's played so beautifully, whether it's mine or the other composers, and I'm so grateful to these musicians and also to Carl for reading with such a great tribute and to Juliana for doing such a great reading of uh, Irving's poem. Um, so I'm gonna, this is the time, I wanna say a few words about my dad. Uh, this is gonna take me, you, know, you try to time these things out, maybe 12 minutes, but we'll see. Um, so my dad wasn't, you know, only my dad, I considered him to, considered him to be one of my best friends. And uh, he was humble, selfless, caring, compassionate, and he had the biggest heart. He didn't have a bitter bone in his body, and he was never vengeful or jealous of anyone. He loved the outdoors, and so it's great that we're doing this concert here with this beautiful background. He would, he would love that. Um, so much so that when he would walk around Delaware Park in Buffalo, where I grew up, um, if he saw a piece of trash, he would pick it up, and he would carry it with him to throw away later. He was, very, uh, he was that kind of person. He cared deeply about his sculpture, and not just his own, he cared about other sculptors and other artists. He loved his family, my mother, me, and my brother very much, and the rest of his family, and he especially loved talking about Philip and my, uh, my brother's son and my son, Dylan. He didn't always quite get what they were up to, and thankfully he's not around to experience, at least what my son's talking about right now, ChatGPT. Uh, he tried to understand what they were up to, but I'm glad that conversation doesn't have to come up, because I don't know if he would have gotten that. Um, he wasn't perfect, but none of us are. And towards the end, he had the sleeping habits of a fruit bat, uh, which drove my mother nuts. Um, and his passionate Irish nature often shone through, but it was always from a good place. He loved history and learning about the rest of the world. Um, and we had so many piles of National Geographic magazines in the basement that we used to joke that if aliens visit, visited the Earth and they went to our basement and that's all they saw, we wouldn't know what they'd think. You know, hundreds. It was a lot of National Geographics and he kept them all. Um, he wasn't religious. And my parents worked hard at exposing both my brother and I to Christianity and Judaism. But my dad really wasn't religious at all. And I guess we knew we weren't really a religious family when we tried to reconcile everything by placing on the uh, Christmas tree uh, instead of a traditional angel, a menorah. So that's when we knew it was all over. Um, my father was always supportive of me and my mother and my brother, and he was a tireless supporter of his kids in general. And he loved my mother and her work. And as an artist, and he also supported her full-heartedly when she decided to earn her doctorate and become a bilingual educator. As a teacher, my father is extremely dedicated. He was supportive of his colleagues and incredibly proud of his students. In fact, he kept boxes of mementos, photos, assignments from all of his students, and even sculptures from a few of them. He loved teaching, and he built the sculpture department at the University at Buffalo from the ground up. He was a brilliant sculptor, he won numerous awards, and he created a ton of sculptures. He fought his whole life for what he believed in, artistically or otherwise. He never wavered from his commitment to his artistic ideals. So one of my favorite memories as a child was helping him in his studio, which was in the backyard. It was a converted three-car garage. Just being able to watch him work and hang out in the studio was a thrill. There was a period of time when my mother was painting at the same time on the third floor of our house. And the smell of clay in the studio and my mother's oil paints, I grew up thinking that her artistic parents, having two artistic parents was normal, and also seeing my dad's sculptures with breasts and vaginas everywhere was normal. And dead birds, my mother loved dead birds, and of course her landscape and still life paintings which were very beautiful. And I thought this was normal, but it took my friends coming over to point out that it wasn't normal. <laughs> so, and I thought all families were like this, and it wasn't until I was older that I realized that I had very special parents and, as artists. When he took my brother and I to the old art department at Bethune in Buffalo, he let us roam free and play with whatever was lying around and not being used. My brother and I would find discarded scraps of wood, metal, and plexiglass and use the band saws and drills to craft little pieces of art. For a while, he kept his eye on us and showed us how to use these machines, but eventually he left us alone. He trusted us not to kill ourselves or cut off our finger or limb. This was a different era, clearly, and definitely would not be happening in this helicopter parenting age we live in now. A few other memories. I remember there was a period when there was this old man who lived across the street and who didn't have anyone taking care of him. And my dad would take him out to eat or pick up groceries for him. And I didn't think much of this at the time because I was young, but now that I'm older, I realized he was just trying to do a good deed. And that really rubbed off on me in a good way. 
My father would take us sledding to Delaware Park in Buffalo. We would go camping in the Adirondacks. We would visit the Buffalo Zoo, the Aquarium, Niagara Falls, and all kinds of places together. We would go across the border to Canada to my parents' favorite Chinese restaurant. Ironically, especially in his last few years, my favorite memories of him were phone calls. He usually called me during his most lucid moments, which were often early in the morning or really late at night, and we had some amazing conversations. We had hundreds of conversations about art, history, especially art history, and his experiences in the Korean War and music. I'm gonna tell the following story because it's the last time I heard him laugh, a few weeks before he died, after I reminded him of it, of this story. It was pretty traumatic at the time, but in hindsight, it's kind of funny. So I'm gonna tell you about it. One time, while camping in the Adirondacks, my dad decided, and this was just me and him, he decided that it would be a good idea to hike up Mount Marcy, the tallest mountain in New York State, at 5,344 feet. I think it was around, I was 12 years old, and it was around 16.7 miles of trails, and not super easy trails either. I'm not sure why my, what my dad was thinking, bringing me up at such a young age, that kind of a trail, but now that I have a son of my own, I understand. We didn't pack enough food or water, and I was thirsty. So I asked him if it would be okay to drink the river water. Sure, he said, it's clean. Anyone who hikes knows that you never ever drink water without filtering it from a river. Later in the day, I began cramping up and had horrible explosive diarrhea. So, and I had a really painful rash. And as we hiked, he hiked 20 feet beyond me. I screamed at him that I had to wash myself in the river. I stripped down and was washing myself. And I look off in the distance and he was taking pictures. <laughs> I was mortified. By the time I made it up to the top of the mountain, it was dark out, it was starting to downpour. We found a rock cave and tried holing up in there and sleeping for the night, or at least until the rain stopped, without sleeping bags or a tent. We thought we'd get back and down in one day. We were wet and freezing. After a couple hours of this, it was still raining, but my dad decided it would be a good idea to try and make it back down the mountain. Eight miles worth of trail. I was miserable. We found a few college kids who were camping as we made our way down, and they graciously let us, leave, let us use their tents. I slept in the tent, and my dad used a spare blanket and slept outside. The only food they had was these little bit of honey candies, which I was grateful for. In the morning, we thanked the hikers profusely and made it down the mountain, and then headed to a restaurant. And I don't think I've ever been more hungry in my entire life. I mentioned this story because as we were hiking, he told me he wanted his ashes spread on Mount Marcy. And we are hoping to finally honor his wishes and do it this August. This time, We'll bring water bottles with life straws. His influence on me is amazing, and I truly, really deeply love both of my parents' art. And as the saying goes, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He loved classical music, and that came from my father, for me to love classical music. And I have very strong memories of him playing music for me and my brother, everything from Russian composers like Stravinsky and Shostakovich to Bach and beyond. I have memories of him playing Brandenburg concertos, Shostakovich's The Nose, and Stravinsky's Soldier's Tale while holding me and dancing around the living room. It's taken my entire life to realize how much I relied on him. His love, his comfort, his voice, his reaching out even though he knew I was busy because he really wanted to talk. And I think he sensed how much I really wanted to talk to him as well. It's not that I needed his approval. It's that I wanted it because I respected his opinion and his artistry. Being an artist can be an incredibly lonely existence, and to have parents that understand this is truly one of the greatest gifts one could ever hope for. He was one of my rocks. I could always count on him to check in on me, even as I got older. It's truly true what they say, but you never truly realize how much you love somebody until they're gone, especially your parents. I was very lucky to have him as a father. I think my dad's father's death affected my father and permeated his entire life. When he was a teenager, he was called out of his classroom and told to go home. He arrived home to find his dad, who was in his 40s, dead from a heart attack, slumped over in his car while trying to push start it. One of the only things, you know, lose, nothing's worse than losing a parent when you were young. His own dad never saw what a great artist, husband, and father he became. He never got to experience his dad growing old the way my brother and I did. My dad was never too impressed by this fact, but when I said he'd likely make it that far, twice as old as his own father, I thought it was amazing. I think it's a minor miracle that he survived almost twice as long as, my fa as his father, but he did. During one of the last conversations I had with him that he could understand, I told him how much I loved him, 
and how important he was to me. Then I asked him if there was anything I could do for him, thinking he'd say something profound, and he smiled and said, chocolate. Even to, this end, he had a, even to the end, he's had a sense of humor. The irony of watching a parent die who was an atheist, and being an atheist myself, is that I so desperately want to believe. I think now, more than ever in my life, I understand the need for believing in an afterlife and in a God because the emptiness of not believing any of this is so overwhelming and utterly lonely. There's nothing I would want more and nothing that would cause me to believe in God and in the afterlife than to receive a sign. Anything would do. Seeing his ghost on our property, a bird landing when it's called for, anything at all. At least there's comfort in knowing that for the rest of my life, I'll keep my word to him, that I will do everything I can to help him fulfill his legacy and cast his sculptures that he wasn't able to cast before he died and make sure that they're displayed prominently and to make sure everyone knows that he's one of the greatest sculptors who ever lived to the best of my ability. For a man who was so full of life in his prime, his last moments were strangely calm. For somebody whose life was so full of sound and whose sons chose lives so full of sound, his end was strangely quiet, save for some of his favorite music that we played for him right before he took his last breath and left this world. In closing, if I had to sum up my father's legacy, it would be his family, his art, and his former students. Dad, we will miss you dearly, and you will never be forgotten. You and your work will live on forever, and we love you.
one more song. Why not? One more. One more.